Welcome to Asset TV. Today, I am joined in studio by Ed Coyne, Senior Managing Partner at Sprott. He is here to discuss how investors should be thinking about the energy transition to uranium and battery metals. And always a pleasure to have you here in studio and congratulations on Sprott's AUM and products we, which continue to expand. What's driving the growth? Yeah, it's been really interesting. You know, Sprott has a long history of being in precious metals over you know, multiple decades, close, you know, a little over four decades now. And gold and silver have always been the foundation of our firm. And even today at 25 plus billion, um, gold and silver remain the core of what we do. Um, but what we have seen over the last half a decade or so was there was other opportunities in the metals market, um, particularly in the energy transition space, whether you're talking about the storage of energy through battery technology and battery metals, um, or the creation of energy through nuclear, we were seeing more and more opportunities out there to expand our footprint. So about two and a half, three years ago now, we started exploring the uranium opportunity. Started off first with the physical market and more recently got into the equity markets with a senior uh, large cap uh, mining ETF and a small cap or junior mining ETF. And we've had tremendous success there. We're well north of $5 billion in capital raised in that space. And we're seeing both institutions, uh, retail investors, and financial advisors all starting to move to that space as a way to diversify their portfolio. So we're seeing the continued growth in the gold and silver, the traditional precious metals market. But more recently, we're seeing very uh, dynamic growth in the energy transition space. On the subject of gold, because obviously it's traditionally a safe haven That's asset, right. given the negative news flow, how has gold fared recently? Yeah, it's interesting. When I talk to people this year, like, gee, why hasn't gold done better? And I'm like, well, it's up about seven, seven and a half percent. S and P is about 14. So yeah, the S and P is doubling gold year to date, um, or around there. You know, it, it changes every day, of course. But if you look at the last couple of years, um, gold's actually outperforming the S and P. The S and P is actually negative over the last, you know, 24 months. Um, so it's still behind the eight ball, so to speak. Um, and, and gold's done quite well. If you look at it even over a five-year basis, gold has given you S&P-like returns. And over the last couple of decades, it's actually outperformed the S&P. So what I tell people is when you think about gold, you have to widen your lens. You can't look at it on a quarter to quarter, even a year to year basis. You have to look at it on a multiple market cycle basis to judge if it is doing its actual job. And I think one of the things that people mistakenly uh, think about when they're looking at gold is they say, well, it doesn't pay a dividend, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't have any earnings, so why would I buy that? Why would I just buy the S&P? And, and my response has always been the same. Well, that's the entire point of gold. You want an asset that is different, that performs differently at different times for different reasons. So gold's done quite well. Now, the, the one thing that I think people are scratching their heads on is like, gee, we have, now we have you know, wars on two different fronts. Um, we've got uh, you know, record level interest rates um, rising. Um, the economy, though, is, is actually doing quite well. I mean, I think we might get it right with a soft landing. Who knows? Um, there might be some people booing me right now that are watching that, but uh, I've never seen so many people root for a recession in my life. But um, they may be getting it right. It's to be determined on that. Um, but what's interesting about that is that gold has continued to sort of play its role through that entire environment. So when you talk about it from a geopolitical standpoint, that's just change in price. Right? That's interesting to talk about and, and it hits the news, but it's not really the value or the purpose of gold. Gold is really over those multiple market cycles and that's how we encourage people to look at it. Outside of precious metals, what else should investors be thinking about? Sure, well, you know, I mentioned our, our energy transition suite, how that's starting to grow. Um, you think about it really in a couple ways. You think about energy transition in the storage of energy, which would obviously be the battery technology space, whether you're talking about backup batteries for wind and solar, to batteries to power our cars. Um, and then you talk about the creation of energy, which for the most part, um, if you get away from like wind and solar, you're looking at nuclear. Uh, nuclear is the only 24 seven base load energy source out there. Um, whether you're a conservative or a liberal, a Democrat or a Republican, everyone's agreeing that we need to move to a carbon neutral footprint. Um, everyone agrees that nuclear needs to be part of that footprint. So right now we're seeing uranium, both again, as I mentioned earlier, on the institutional side, the retail side, the advisor side, start to gain a lot of traction. Uh, the battery market, I think Wall Street's kind of still figuring that one out. Um, I think it's a longer road. Uh, clearly there's demand there. Um, we've got more and more battery processing plants being built, but not as many mines being uh, discovered and, uh, and coming online. So there'll continue to be a sort of a, a gap between um, the supply and demand, really on all those assets. So we're, we're really enthusiastic about what we're seeing in there in that space. Um, and again, you know, thinking about energy transition from a, from a, actually from a consumption standpoint as a consumer driving an electric car um, to the storage, to the creation 
Um, so there's a lot going on in that space, and I encourage investors to take a new look at the metals market in general uh, and, and find you know, some additional opportunities that we're seeing out there. So you mentioned uranium, which is one of the best performing assets here today. What do you think is driving some of that strength? Well, I think it goes back to what I talked about a moment ago with, with supply and demand. So if you look at what's happening on the demand side of nuclear power and what's happening with nuclear reactors, you had the first reactor come online in the United States over 20 years in Georgia. Um, you've got reactors that were shuttered effectively, um, not from a technology standpoint, just from a licensing operation standpoint, reopening in the United States. Um, around 18, 19% right now of our power in the US comes from nuclear. Um, in Europe, France is around 70, 75%. Um, and then the, everybody else is in between that. Um, and what you're seeing is not only existing reactors coming back online, creating more demand for, for uh, uranium, but you're also seeing new reactors, uh, both here and abroad, uh, in the tunes of 20 or 30 different reactors, depending on what country you're talking about. In addition to that, you're seeing these small and modular reactors start to become a reality in the next half a decade or so, which are these three to four story apartment size building uh, reactors that you can almost plug and play into a community to create energy sources there. So there's a lot of demand happening in the nuclear marketplace um, for clean energy, 24-7 uh, energy, um, but there hasn't been a lot of new discoveries. Um, the cost of extraction for an existing mine is around 60 to 70 bucks a, a, you know, a, a pound. Um, for a new mine to come online, it's probably closer to 80, 85 a pound, and that's a moving target. So currently it's sitting at around 65 or 70. Um, so you haven't seen a lot of supply hitting the market. We think that's a multi-decade phenomena. So I think Wall Street and investors in general are looking at that and trying to fast forward out. Well, what does this look like the next couple of decades? Um, if we are moving in this direction, if we truly want to be carbon neutral by 2050, let's see if we get halfway there. You know, we get halfway to carbon neutral by 2050. The demand for this is going to continue to rise, um, and there's just not enough supply right now. And that's a multi-decade uh, issue we see, and we think that will potentially drive higher prices. So I think that's what's really driving it right now is the world's kind of starting to wake up to that. Um, I'm not saying it's going to go straight up. It's going to continue to be volatile like all these metals, um, but we like the long-term opportunity there. And what are some other metals that investors should consider? Yeah, you know, if you think about what's going on in the world, as I mentioned, the battery metals, um, something as simple as copper, um, and some places even steel, you know? So these old metals that have been around forever, everyone knows what copper is, um, but you, you can't move a, a electricity from point A to point B in most cases without copper. Now, copper is interesting because you can recycle copper over and over again, it doesn't lose its connectivity. Um, so the supply demand phenomenon is not as dire there as in some other metals, like a lithium, for example, or a cobalt, um, which is also needed for battery technology. So there's a lot of ways you can think about that space. Um, there's not a lot of readily available physical metal to invest in. So in some cases, there's option strategies and so forth out there. Um, we've created a full suite of ETFs to give you exposure to that, whether it's our flagship ETF, SCTM, on that side that gives you exposure to all the metals, or specific ETFs that give you exposure to just lithium or just nickel and so forth. Um, so those are also something that I would have investors think about or consider. Those, I would say, though, from, a, from an investment standpoint, are probably going to continue to be volatile as the world and as Wall Street sort of figures out what does this battery metal movement actually mean from an investment standpoint? So I would say there, um, be a little more cautious as far as how you think about allocating to that space, but that would be another thing I would put on my list when you're thinking about metals in general. How should investors think about using precious metals and energy transition materials within a larger portfolio? Sure, if you think about it, you know, forever gold and silver have lived in the commodity basket. And they are commodities. All these metals are commodities, right? They get brought out of the ground, they get consumed, they get used, they get transferred, and they are a commodity. But more and more uh, of our investors are really slotting them into the alternative asset bucket. And once they do that, the narrative or the vision of what these assets or these metals can do for their portfolio changes. Um, because so often we say, well, I've got my gold allocation, I have a commodity fund, and it's got 4% in gold. And I'm like, well, that gets so buried in that fund, it's not really gonna drive the return pattern you're hoping for by allocating to that space. So what I tell investors is, you know, rethink the way you look at commodities in general, particularly in the metals market. And when you think about it as an alternative asset or a low cost liquid hedge, if you think about gold and other metals out there, they're, they're liquid assets. Um, they're relatively low cost compared to say a two and 20 or a one and 10 hedge fund. Uh, not knocking hedge funds, I'm just saying these are different solutions out there. I um, mean, so I would tell investors to really think about it as a true alternative to their stock and bond portfolio. And when you look at the long-term performance patterns 
of gold and silver, which is sort of the, 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 um, the established metals. And then more recently, um, the uraniums and the nickels and the cobalts and so forth, um, they do have a different performance pattern than the traditional market. So I would encourage investors to think about it as part of their alternative sleeve when they're looking to allocate to the space. Well, from the macro landscape driving the performance of these metals to the roles that they can play in portfolios, thank you so much, Ed, for taking the time to lay out all of this universe for us. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for tuning in. From our studios in New York, I'm Jillian Kemmerer for Asset TV.